All right, everybody, uh, let's uh, go ahead and begin our panel discussion. It's my pleasure to uh, introduce our moderator this morning, Andy Weldon. Uh, Andy is an associate professor of civil engineering and environmental and ecological engineering. Uh, he leads a, a, a team that uh, looks at a many aspects, microbiological engineering, data science, um, policy, and understanding, uh, better understanding how to make our waters uh, safer and cleaner for, for drinking and other applications, an important topic as we've heard already this morning. Uh, with that, uh, please help me welcoming uh, Dr. Weldon. Thank you very much. Um, we're all here today to, to kind of celebrate um, Dr. Rose here from Michigan State University and these amazing individuals as well from uh, Purdue. Um, I'm going to introduce them in a second, but I did want to uh, mention that uh, a lot of the students had to go to their next class, but they plan to watch online. Uh, so this is live streamed right now, and it will be recorded. So thank you all for coming today, and, and for those of you listening in. <coughs> the College of Engineering uh, has assembled this amazing cast of individuals here we're going to hear from, who are experts in water, and they're going to share their experiences. <clears throat> and solutions associated with the title of this discussion, which is Protecting Drinking Water. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce some folks. Uh, if you're just tuning in now, um, to my right here is, is Dr. Uh, Joan Rose, and it is my honor to be here with you sharing the stage. Uh, Dr. Rose is a Michigan State University Homer Nolan Chair in Water Research, and she's in the College of Agriculture, in natural resources and departments of fisheries, wildlife, crops, and soil sciences. Uh, thank you for coming. Dr. Rose is one of the world's foremost experts on water <coughs> microbial risk assessment. Her recognitions are simply downright impressive. If you were here earlier, when the Dean of Engineering mentioned some of her awards and accomplishments, one person would be honored just to have one of those, uh, and, and she um, is even an honorary citizen of Singapore, and I don't know if we have determined if she's paying taxes there. Uh, but anyways, um, I just wanted to list a few of them. In 2016, she was awarded the Stockholm Water Prize, World Water Prize, which is the world's most prestigious water award for her successful translation of science to policy and for her leadership in developing the tools and guidelines required to give policy and regulatory life to science. In 2011, she was elected to the National Academy of Engineering and has a number of prestigious service on National Academy boards, scientific advisory boards in different countries. We are lucky to have the opportunity to be here with us today and she is also uh, collaborating on a Purdue University, Michigan State University, Tulane University, and University of Memphis uh, research study. So next, I'd like to introduce you to some of our Purdue University experts. You can find more information about them at www.purdue.edu. <laughs> the first uh, individual I'd like to introduce you to is Dr. Sarah McMillan. Thank you for joining us. You're welcome. Uh, she is a licensed professional engineer and associate professor of agricultural and biological engineering. The next individual I'd like to introduce you to is Dr. Ellen Wells. Dr. Wells is an assistant professor in the College of Health and Human Sciences here at Purdue. Dr. George Joe. I'd like to introduce you to him. He is a licensed professional engineer as well as an assistant professor in the Lao School of Civil Engineering and Division of Environmental and Ecological Engineering. And finally, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Ron Turco. Dr. Turco is a professor and department head of agronomy and in the College of Agriculture. So with that, let's just get to the questions, <clears throat> okay? These questions have been compiled from social media. We sent out a blast uh, asking people to ask questions. So some of the questions that are going to be asked of these individuals uh, came from social media. <clears throat> and the first question will be for Dr. Rose. So, Dr. Rose. <laughs> I hope it's not a hard question. <laughs> 
with what seems to be constant headlines about unsafe drinking water in the U.S., what can anyone do now to better protect their families and friends? <clears throat> well, I think the first thing is that um, each individual should know something about their watershed that they live in. I think they should know where their source water is, um, where it comes from, um, know something about how it's treated, if it is treated, and where the wastewater goes when they flush their toilet. And surprisingly, uh, individuals that are on their own wells and, and septic tanks have some understanding of this, um, but um, about 60% of those uh, surveyed uh, in the general population actually don't know where their water comes when they turn on their tap. So I think we need to be knowledgeable about our waters and our water systems. And we're going to be asked in our community to um, uh, support uh, funding, or we can be a voice to get federal funding and uh, for infrastructure and improvements and more testing. And so the more we know, um, so we have to be informed. So that's the first thing. Um, I am a big supporter of water testing um, and trying to use that information. So I support the local ordinances that say that point of sale testing, or in Canada, they have once a year testing of some of their groundwaters. And, and then using good IT, you know, we should be using information technology to, to better compile this data, understand the data, and um, be able to do something about it. We do have opportunities for point of use devices and um, at the, or point of entry devices at our homes, at our household. But often people get the wrong one. They, they want to take care of lead and they get carbon filters or they, they are worried about bacteria and they don't have a bacterial filter. Um, and so, and they don't maintain it. So um, as an individual, if you are going to get a point of entry or point of use, then you need to really know um, which system you want to buy for which contaminant, and then to look at the maintenance. So those are the things I think we can do as individuals. Thank you. The next question is from Dr. Joe. From This was submitted through Twitter. Um, the individual indicated that pitcher style charcoal filters are popular at homes and they can remove organic chemicals, not lead or coliform, as the Twitter user indicated. How do you treat your water at your home or are you on a private well? For <laughs> A lot of us at the city of West Lafayette, we rely on our type of water, and they treat it very high quality. So we have seen a lot of these uh, bottled waters. I don't know if you realize that uh, some of these are not regulated. So their quality are maybe not as high as our type of water. But we have a lot of concerns uh, about this uh, malide or other heavy metals, emerging contaminants in our water. So the pitcher style uh, filter, which could be about 30 to $40. It's kind of like a quick and dirty approach. And mostly uh, they are, uh, we have the uh, active carbon inside to filtrate and absorb those contaminants. So I would say it's working. Um, it's, but the thing is you have to regularly maintain it, replace the cartridge frequently. Uh, and as far as I know, we have only a few uh, pitcher style features, uh, the filters that has been certified by some industry organizations such as NSF International. Um, and if you're really concerned about viruses and bacteria and other emerging contaminants that are not regulated, uh, you may consider to put some, like Dr. Rose just mentioned, point of entry or point of use devices to use some reverse osmosis devices. So those are relatively effective to get rid of 99% of the contaminants. Um, but still, uh, as, a, as, as, a, as a professor working in the university uh, or the water industry, it would be great if we have more resources to fund our utilities, fund our water, uh, water treatment plant, wastewater treatment plant, and to help us to get clean water through the tap. Or else, you know, it's, you have to rely on you and our general public may not know all the tricks and the efficiencies. So we are falling into some pitfalls. Thank you. 
Um, the next question is for Dr. McMillan. She has done some amazing work associated with watershed scale stormwater and the, the relationship between that and drinking water. Um, Dr. McMillan, is there a link between stormwater, when it rains, and drinking water? Um, amazing, thank you for that compliment. Um, so yes, we were actually just talking about this a bit at breakfast this morning, so any of the panel can certainly jump in um, on that conversation. But there is a, a fair number of review papers that have talked about correlations between precipitation events and outbreaks of disease and things like that. Um, and that makes a lot of sense because as it rains and we run pollutants off of our landscape, they enter our rivers, and those rivers then join up in with our reservoirs, and a lot of those reservoirs are drinking water supply, right? So there is a process-based and, and obvious link there that makes a lot of sense. Um, and a lot of times, those sources of pollutants could be coming from illicit connections that are kind of things like CSOs or septic tanks that are in the groundwater or other kinds of connections that, that blend into the surface waters when it, when it rains. Um, or they could be things that are kind of dormant in our river system, so in our stream networks or in our stormwater management practices that become resuspended when these peak flows happen. So you can have a rain event that then and triggers kind of re, you know, uh, export, I guess, if you will, of these different kinds of bacterial and viral loads that then make it into, into drinking water supplies. Um, so to kind of second what um, Dr. Rose said about know your watershed, also know your water source. So this might be more or less important depending on where your water supply is coming from and understanding kind of how that connection is, is, is made and, and those rain events really certainly tr contribute. So. Anyone on the panel want to? All right, great. Uh, Dr. Wells is in the, the public health field. She is our resident public health expert up here. She's, <laughs> she helps uh, conduct uh, Purdue University's Masters of Public Health program. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so this next question is for you, and it will represent all of what the public health field in the world thinks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, kidding. <laughs> um, <clears throat> what is what have you seen as the relationship between public health professionals and local or state level drinking water? And then where do you think we need to go? Well, thank you for the introduction and for that very broad question <laughs> that you just gave me. Um, public health is a very, very broad field, so I'm going to focus this on environmental public health workers who would be more likely to work in the, the area of um, water quality and, and water control. So. Um, at the state level, there's actually a lot of people working to help promote um, clean drinking water. And at the state level, they're the ones who do a lot of the testing and enforcement of things like the Safe Drinking Water Act that the EPA has in place, which the Safe Drinking Water Act is what has designated um, um, up the regulatory levels for numerous contaminants in the water supply, including uh, microbes and viruses, bacteria, as well as chemical contaminants. Um, so from the public health perspective at the state level, they go and test water supplies from the drinking water sources often. Um, and they'll also do monitoring of groundwater to try and make sure that the whole system, as, was talking, as we were talking about before, groundwater or rainwater going into the drinking water supply to make sure that those systems are safe. Um, however, I would point out that there's a big loophole, at least as far as the regulations go to protect our drinking water, as far as well water goes. Um, in this state in Indiana, we have a lot of a big rural community, and a lot of them are also on well water. But the regulations that protect our drinking water quality don't apply to people with private wells. So if you have a private well, it's up to you to be responsible to make sure that your water gets tested and that it is um, to standard. Um, and the state health department will help with that in Indiana. The Indiana Department of Health has a good website and lots of information and advice for homeowners who have their own wells on what kinds of things to look for and how to do the testing, and they will assist with the testing. Um, but at the same time, there's a responsibility of education 
as was pointed out by Dr. Rowe, is on behalf of the well owners to know that they have to go out and seek this information themselves. Okay, great. Um, what I'd like to do is, is um, pass it to Dr. Turco, because of his e extensive experience in uh, Indiana water policy and, and, and research. Um, but I'd like to kind of piggyback on top of that question in, in Dr. Wells' um, perspective. What has been your experience in Indiana with regards to, you know, well testing, private well testing? Or my, my experience in Indiana is everyone wants their well tested. Nobody wants to pay for it. That's been my mostly my most of my experience. As in, do you test water? And we'll say yes, or some we used to say yes. And well, could you come and test my well? And I would say, well, it depends if you're in their study area or not. So it's, it it there was a lot of, uh, of of interest in it, but just not a lot of desire to pay for the process. And then my favorite question is, and this has gone on for years, and you guys have all heard this, what's in my water? Can you test for what's in my water? And I will say, how much money do you have? <laughs> well, we, we can then we can then expand the scope of what we're going to look at in your water, depending on how much money you're willing to give us. No one ever actually paid for anything like that, but that was always the the, the, they just don't have a concept of what that statement actually means in terms of the, of the necessary work that would go into that. Uh, I think Indiana, like she said, was, is exactly right. We have a lot of well water in the state. We also have a lot of wastewater in the state that's mm -hmm. unregulated. Uh, that's been some of the work we did a long time ago was looking at distribution of se uh, sewer septic systems and, and poorly maintained septic systems. So in, again, it's a cost issue, right? So you don't have a problem until you have a problem or someone tells you you have a problem. And septic systems will work forever because they just are in the ground and magically everything goes away. Uh, so that's always that's been another issue we've dealt with over the years is looking at uh, distribution of waste materials from septic systems, uh, mostly bacteria. I'm glad I worked on bacteria and not viruses, but that's, uh, so that's, that's beside the point. Uh, um, that we looked at a lot. Of, we looked at a lot of indicator. We did a lot of indicator work on septic systems and things just to get some get some vision of what people were was impacting them. And, it's, and again, it comes down to: uh, Are they willing to spend money to repair the situation? Are there regulations in place? There typically aren't. So it's, it's just a it's it's a cost. It always comes down to uh, the not surprisingly always comes down to the money side of this, right? So are you willing to pay for that situation to get fixed? It's always the case. Um, and again, it's we have some good well water services in the state, like she was saying. Uh, the Indiana Department of Health will actually help you on your well water testing. They'll they'll do a lot of it. It's nothing fancy. It's a big, your basic uh, nutrients and bacteria. But still, it's a good it's a good set of indicators to use to see what's going on. So, in terms of policy in the state, it's uh, there's there's willingness to do things. There's just not again a lot of drive or push to have things happen. Indiana is a hodgepodge of water sources. I mean, we have a lot of groundwater use. We have a lot of surface water. We have some surface water use for drinking. So that makes it, um, it makes it uneven depending on where you are in the state. Supplies are different. So there's different e issues all over the state. There's like a there's like a striping pattern across the state in terms of coming up from the south to the north in terms of supply issues, where the water is coming from, who's using it, and those kind of questions. So it's, 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 a, it's not the same through the whole state. That's really where it gets to be difficult. And you get a lot of what I've witnessed in, in, when I've been in Indianapolis working on these things is, is where you are in the state, your issues are way different. So that's drives the, lo the local part drives a lot of what, what goes on. So okay. Um, a personal perspective, while uh, our family was looking at buying a house, uh, we came across this house with a well, and um, the realtor wanted us to pass papers on it, and we wanted to do testing. Uh, we did testing, and we found out that their septic system was in failure and pumping ammonia into their drinking water well, which was untreated, and um, they had been drinking that water for eight years. And so we don't know when that happened, but certainly testing your wells is important. Um, and right now it, it may seem like people are on their own, but they're really not. There's public health officials at state levels. There's universities across the country where you can go to and ask these questions. Um, so there's opportunities for help. Um, yeah, the other thing I've found working with the state of Indiana is the Department of Natural Resources has a very extensive collection of information on wells in the state they mm -hmm. they do a very they have a very nice web uh, site where they do well records in the state of Indiana and they're very helpful when you have well issues and well problems in terms of supply or contamination or loss of pumping capacity and they'll come out and they'll help you there as well so there, I think there's a lot of capacity in the state around water and water supplies and, and quality so you need to ask jump in real yep. quick 
for something. Uh, it just occurred to me that part of this is like what Joan said at the beginning of this educational component and so many of our rural families have a well for drinking and have a septic system and the shallow drinking water wells, they're very, that groundwater is very connected and that not, might not be something that everybody thinks about or even really kind of recognizes or, or in, is intuitive to them. So, I, I, and I'm not trying to like say that this is something that shouldn't be known, but it's just something that I think is a really important component to the to the water story is the social components of how do we do a better job of, of supporting po folks to get water testing, of supporting kind of the technology at the point of use. Um, I, I think we all have similar stories of ourselves or our family members or friends who have had water contaminated wells, things like that. So I think it's important to, to bring that that education piece to light and finding resources for that is another challenge as well. Yeah. So on the piggyback on top of education, Dr. Rose, <laughs> when you are at a social gathering and people find out that you work in water, what is the one question you always get asked? The one question I always get asked. I, I think they they that uh, often they'll ask you know uh, what do I do with my own water? Yep. You know um, I am on a well now. Um, I grew up on groundwater in Victorville, California, which at that time wasn't chlorinated, but is not far from the aquifer that was famous in the Aaron Brockovich study. And um, and so this whole idea of you're in a desert, you grow up in a desert, and there's no water to be seen anywhere hardly, uh, but you do have a nice um, pristine supply of groundwater that that then just be destroyed very quickly, you know, uh, with your neighbor. And so uh, you know, in thinking about that, when I was in Tucson, I was also in groundwater, and they were trying to bring surface water in. And when they put the surface water into the pipes, they had all this dissolution of iron and everything else. The utility manager got, you know, fired, and um, they now uh, pump that surface water into the ground so that it, and then and they don't use the water plant that they built uh, for uh, necessarily for treating water. And and when I got to Florida, you know, I'm on a municipal um, system, surface water system. And um, Florida was interesting because it's like, yeah, uh, our, our, our water is robust. It, it's got a lot of good tastes and odors in Florida. <laughs> so you either had groundwater or a mixture of surface waters, and there was always just tastes and odors and high organics, even in the, in the groundwater. Florida was an outlier. And um, I think that's the first time we had a carbon uh, POU put on um, our system. And I remember my, my physician finding out that, uh, you know, I worked in water and he goes, I, I have one of those uh, treatment systems and it's, it's in my sink and he goes, and it's working really well. They told me to change it, you know, two years ago, but it's been working fine for like four years. And I'm <laughs> like, what, you know? <laughs> so it's that whole thing, you know, about, you know, so they, you know, so it's your own, you know, bringing like, my own water story, I guess, uh, talking about that, the different places I've lived and, and uh, drinking untreated water, surface water in Wyoming before they filtered up there. Nice, pristine uh, water that had Giardia in it um, from the mountains, <laughs> but great water, you know. Um, and now I'm on my own well in Michigan, and that's, this is the first time I've been on my own um, a system and I use my water for some of the experiments take well water and so they test my water a lot now I'm always like paranoid about what they're gonna find and I'm gonna have to go back and do something to my well um, uh, but uh, so I test my water a lot actually my own groundwater so I but I think that's the question I get what about do you you know and I get do I drink bottled water am I against bottled water and that type of thing too they ask me about the the bottled water issue as well so yeah great um we'll just go down the row uh anybody want to add something about what questions they get when people find out about what you're doing or if you're a professor and i, I get a very similar question it's it's i've had it a number of times from people who live in west lafayette who are desperately afraid of the water supply here and they want, they want to know if we've tested it and what's in the water here in West Lafayette. And I have to go through an explanation process of how it's handled and what's, how it's, what's done with it. And they're, and they're convinced that 
we're not telling them the truth, that there's something wrong with the water here. And, and they need to buy large quantities, I see them in the grocery store, large quantities of bottled water and and, and I'm trying to tell them that's just West Lafayette water sold to you differently. But it's, uh, <laughs> but it's, I don't tell them that for more money. Uh, but it just, that's always surprises me is, is, is the, is the non acceptance of a supply of, of, a, of a regulated supply like a West Lafayette or wherever you are, Indianapolis or, and, and the fact that it is tested regularly and it is a solid supply of water, but it's, it's just, it just kind of bothers me. They don't trust the process in, in that regard. But anyway. the stories around Flint and other things increase the distrust. Um, no, a little bit, but not really. It's just, it's been, it's been. There's been this subgroup that's always been um, concerned that they're being lied to. So, but they, they ask me the same question: What kind of treatment do I use? And I say I don't use anything. I just take it out of the tap, and they're like, really. Mm. <laughs> have a water softener, but you know, drink that anyway. It's, well, they, it, there is, yeah, right. So in Indiana, we have water softeners or um, personal experience. If you don't have water softener, your appliance will stop working in about six months, and you have to buy all new ones. Um, so as you move from place to place, uh, you, you know, while the water may be, be safe, there's different conditioning practices that happen to it, uh, and you want to find friends in the area quickly to tell you you need a water softener before all your appliances break. <coughs> Just saying. Um, <laughs> anyways, um, so any other thoughts about what people ask you from, you know, if you visited other countries and, and they ask you what the water's like there or any perspectives? Um. As a side note, we just replaced the water softener in my house a few months ago, so I'm very sympathetic to that the comment you just made. Um, in terms of questions I get asked about water, because I come from a public health specialty, I often get asked, is there a risk to my health from drinking the water from my house? And the truth is it's a very complicated question to answer because every individual is different. We have different genetic makeups. We have different um, nutritional habits and other habits, and all of this will affect our health. So while we can say that you know if the water, we can test the water for a virus or a bi or a chemical contaminant, but the question of whether that level will directly relate to a response for an individual person is a lot harder to answer because each person will react differently to the same amount of um, quantity of contamination in their water. So um, although we can't answer the question, I think an approach to be would be a precautious one and to try and make sure that your your water meets all the guidelines and criteria that have been set out. Thank you. I'll tell one little small story. When I, I, since I work more in land and water as opposed to in drinking water, I always get, I tell, oh, I work, you know, on, on floodplains and stormwater and all these things. And, you know, one of my sites is on the Wabash, and they look at me like I'm crazy. You actually, like, go near the Wabash? They think it's this cesspool. Um, I think they get this perception as they see during storm events that it turns this beautiful chocolate milk color, and that must indeed mean that it's heavily polluted. I'm not saying that it's something you should drink, but like any surface water, it gets turbid when it rains, and we have those issues. Issues, but you know you can go kayaking on, and you can be in the rivers around around Indiana and around other places in the Midwest. Maybe wash your hands before you eat your lunch. <laughs> Great. Thank you. So actually, um, the next question is for Dr. McMillan because of uh, some of the discussion we had earlier about the relationship between agriculture, such as farming and drinking water, and, and are there any um, major issues that happened recently or in the last five years that, that may have had national significance? Such a leading question. <laughs> so I'll start, and I'm sure Ron might actually bring in some additional details. Um, so I'm originally from Iowa, and um, so this was very uh, salient in, in my going back to Iowa over the past five years or so. Um, but if anyone is familiar, there was a recent lawsuit brought by the city of Des Moines water treatment um, plant, basically, uh, against some of the counties that drain into the Raccoon River, um, alleging that 
drainage districts within these counties, so right, drainage districts are operating in Iowa and Illinois and Indiana and all these places, <coughs> allowing our formerly wetlandy, swampy soils to be drained for productive agriculture. And these drainage districts are given pretty great latitude to be able to maintain the drainage system, dredge channels, install drain pipes, et cetera. Um, but this, the, what was happening was there was so much nitrates entering into the these piping systems and then into the Raccoon River, such that the concentrations within the drinking water treatment plant were in the tens, sometimes even greater, uh, of milligrams per liter of nitrate. And as a point of reference, 10 milligrams per liter is the drinking water standard, which is also really, really high in and of itself for ecological reasons. Um, and so the city was paying lots and lots of money to remove this nitrate, and they basically sued the counties upstream, saying that they were in violation of the Clean Water Act because they were essentially not being not regulating as a point source, and they should be, because they have tile drains that are coming into, into the river. It went through the state legislature and to the state Supreme Court, um, not all the way up to the federal Supreme Court, um, but basically the court sided with the counties and not with the with the um, with the city treatment plant for some, per I would say, um, procedural kinds of reasons. But in short, they gave. It was very difficult to kind of point fingers at individuals, and those counties did not have, the counties might have jurisdiction, but the drainage districts did not have ability to regulate and treat. So it set an interesting precedent, because now we're thinking about water treatment plants and, and agriculture and how they're integrated into and together, and, and who's responsible ultimately for the bearing the costs of keeping our water safe and clean. Um, that was a couple years ago that the lawsuit was dismissed, and now it's in kind of the legislature's hands, and there's a lot of work going on in Iowa, so Dr. Frankenberger works a lot with some faculty there as well on different agricultural practices, and there's a lot of research going on to try to understand how to better keep the, the fertilizers and, and all the things we do in agriculture on the land rather than in the water. So, Ron, anything to add? Well, Indiana is very similar. Uh, we, we, again, like I said earlier, we have a hodgepodge of water sources for drinking. There's a lot of groundwater users, some surface water. Where there's surface water use, they also tend to blend groundwater in to, to, to reduce the level of nitrate. So there's, there's sort of a, uh, that process is Indianapolis is probably the most illustrative example of that, where they, they have uh, surface water coming in that does contain nitrate. They treat it, they do some things to it, but they end up blending it with groundwater to, to reduce the overall uh, uh, nitrate levels that go out in, in the system. Uh, and they are in a, a fairly progressive effort upstream of those supplies to do some things on land management and to uh, reduce the nitrate coming in. So it's a, it's a preventative model here. They're trying to work on some uh, a, a right away, a, a riverway uh, treatment systems, some uh, wetlands, some two-stage ditches, all those kind of things in order to try to reduce the, uh, the, uh, um, the nitrate load getting to the Indi Indianapolis. So that's that's. Every, and everyone's really sensitive to what goes on in Iowa because that's sort of a bellwether in terms of where the legislation is and, 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 and those kind of issues. So in Indiana, the other thing that's interesting about Indiana, and, and Sarah and I and a number of faculty here at Purdue are working on this project, is up in northeast Indiana there's um, a, a series of rivers that loop into the state and then loop back out of the state from Ohio and they end up in Lake Erie. And as you know, Lake Erie's got phosphorus issues. So we're working on a project up there to look at the phosphorus and where the phosphorus is moving through. And it's a very, phosphorus turns into the next, it will be the next issue, it already sort of has become that. But it's a very interesting element because it's not so dynamic like nitrate. It just it hangs around. You get what's referred to as legacy phosphorus and you get all these other things going on in the systems. It's a very difficult situation in terms of trying to understand where all the, the phosphorus is moving and how it's, and how it's behaving. So that's an, that's an issue that's out there as a, as a, as a, con a concern point for a lot of people. So. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, Dr. Rose, uh, and I, something that um, got me thinking and talking with a lot of people in the audience about after your uh, seminar was where are we going to be in the next 50 years in terms of Will we have the same types of buildings and technologies? Will we be doing the same things? Will we be talking about the same issues? Or, you know, if you were to predict the future in one or two things that you really want to happen, wh what would that be? Yeah, well, I guess I'm, 
I'm an optimist to a certain extent, and I think there is uh, great opportunity. Um, and if we bring all the smart people that we need into the water profession, every, everything from resource econ economists uh, to technicians and um, engineers, um, I think we can solve these um, issues. Um, I think that we're going to be looking at distributed treatment, more distributed treatment as well as centralized treatment, and some innovative, uh, you know, technologies. Maybe even some of these um, high-rate uh, treatment technologies for stormwater, um, or even point of use devices on tile drains, problematic tile drains. So um, I think we could jumpstart. Uh, wastewater uh, infrastructure in Africa to resource recovery facilities where there's energy, nutrients, and water being developed for the community. And um, the we're going to have to think about animal pollution and how we handle animal waste because we've been thinking about uh, human wastewater. But the FAO has just come out and said that more pollution is coming from animals now than humans. And we haven't really figured out how we're going to handle all that manure. And is manure really safe? Or how long does it have to be digested or whatever we're going to do to it to make sure that it is safe to apply on the land? So I'm hoping that that gets addressed, that there's some forward thinking people that think about that 50 years, because what we do now, what we invest in now, has to, we have to be thinking about that lasting 50 years and um, a system that we can build assets in and then, and then keep up. So that 50 and 100 years, when my grandchildren have their grandchildren, we're going to have cleaner water. Because right now our water quality is degrading. We're having more algal blooms. We're having these problems. And um, we can make a difference. We can reverse that. But it's, uh, it's got to be that long-term goal. Thank you. Anybody else would like to, to weigh in on where we're going to be in 50 years, they'll play this back 50 years from now uh, to, to determine if we were right or a little bit off. I, I think the one thing that as, uh, as a scientist I, I've come to really appreciate recently, and you, you're sort of alluded to it a lot, and we work on it some here a lot, is the role of social sciences in this whole process in terms of, uh, of reaching people and, letting, and educating people and letting them understand where they are in the process. We can tell them. We can tell them a lot of numbers, but that doesn't really change their mind. We don't. We need to understand what their point of view is and what's driving their decision-making process. And you, you would live with this. So it's 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 a really important aspect that we've kind of ignored. I think that's into the future. Something we need to really, in our in our efforts, really embrace much more. Sort of the human dimension of it, where where the person or the people in the process are with what you're telling them and how, how, they're, how they're processing it. So that's a really uh, important aspect here. Yeah, that social and cultural yeah. engagement. But Annie, what about um, pipes? Our pipes and our premise plumbing. <laughs> yeah, what about pipes? So that's going to be the new frontier, right? right? So, so we can turn that question on anybody here. Is that is that where this was going? Um, so, so yeah, so one of the questions that did come in from Facebook was what type of pipe should I install? Um, and that's something that, that I work on. But um, it, it, I'll just mention um, it depends on where you are. Uh, if you have copper pinhole leaks, uh, it, it's probably not a good idea to reinstall copper in that water under those conditions again. So it, it really depends on, on where you are in, in the, the system and the plumbing that it is. Um, so with regards to the 50 or 100 years, right? So, so we have two people on record. Uh, for where we're going to be. Um, <clears throat> I, I would also ask, um, with regards to engaging the public, I guess uh, that's going to be really important. How can we do that better? How, how, how have, have, have we tried to do it, or your colleagues have tried to do it? Are there any good examples of, of it doesn't have to be you, it could be somebody else, or you could talk in third person? Um, so, however you want to describe it, this is open to everybody. Well, I'll jump in for one small thing because I think this is something that Ron brought up is really important. Oftentimes, we put our expert hat on and we say, here's the knowledge that you need. 
Um, but really what we should be doing, I think, is a lot more two-way sharing of knowledge. There's a lot of knowledge. Beten take any at issue, take any um, region of the world and local knowledge and understanding of your water system, your environment, your political system, whatever it might be, um, the people who live it every day, the people who farm that land every day, the people who live in that city every day, experience that and have value. And that, I think, two-way sharing of knowledge is really, really critical to starting things and moving forward in this education component. Um, I know that I've personally been on both sides of that where I've gone to a community meeting and said, here's what we're doing. What do you think? That's not gone so well. Um, and I've also been on the very much the listening side, sitting and, and, and just hearing concerns and questions and trying to answer them best I can. So I think the two-way sharing is something that we all need to do better. So. I think sometimes, um, like the Flint, Michigan case, uh, does help improve the awareness of the water quality issue among the lay public. So a lot of people may now realize how the water is treated and what are the potential pipes may have a huge public health impact. So as uh, teachers at the university, I think sometimes if we could integrate some of those case studies, um, maybe even Twitter, Facebook, and also among, at least among our students in the relative areas. So we might plant the seeds to help to them to realize that this is really an issue. You, you need to drink water every day, right? So this is relevant for everyone. So I think we, uh, if our um, we put some of these materials purposely, so slowly, well, eventually, I think more people gonna gonna realize so water is a critical issue, and they should put more attention to this. Well, that's a great great point, and I want to open it up to everybody. In your classes that you have taught, what are the, 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 the memorable experiences that you had with students or activities where maybe it involved water and you, were, and you said, yes, like that's, wow, this worked really well, or, or they, they, they're more excited about this than I am right now, you know? I mean, what types of examples can you share, Dr. Rose? Yeah, I, I like the idea of case studies or, you know, having um, um, group group projects on, um, we just had a series and one of the, and I said, anything in water, you just got to choose the problem, you know, and then describe the problem and potential solutions. So the presentation had to look at both. And um, the two that really struck me as, as quite interesting, one was plastics in the water, they chose plastics and uh, putting the statistics together and all the attention that that's getting, everything from macroplastics and BPA and its M impact and, and um, uh, microplastics and then potential solutions, which a lot are policy. A lot of the solutions were policy driven or new material science really, right, and packaging and things like that. And then the other one was this nature and health. They did a, a case study on um, showing that more exposure to nature improved health, blood pressure and all this kind of thing. And they talked about different ways, like even virtual exposure to nature through our uh, information technology improved health. So I, I love the idea of group projects and case studies and, and putting these problems to the students because they really put it, you know, they put it together in such a nice package uh, with the information. And they were enthusiastic and uh, they were learning and I was learning and I really enjoyed that. So I, I think we need to do more of these real world, you know, issues um, where these bright minds and, and recognizing that, guess what? These problems don't get solved by an individual. They get solved collectively at different levels, everything from policy to individual actions. That's how these problems get solved. And I think that awareness is really important. Um, to add to that, I, I love the answers that everybody's given so far. And in addition, when talking with students about um, water quality, something that I like to encourage them to do is figure out what the water quality is in their own area, too. Working on a project and talking about a case study is one thing, but the, you can find the information on the water testing for, if you're on a municipal water system, you can get that information. And I think that's very eye-opening for a lot of students who haven't thought about the fact that their water might have some issues from time to time, and that you can go figure, find that information yourself. And I think that also is very empowering 
and a good um, a good jump start to lifelong learning and f encouraging students and others to learn more about the water and other aspects of their environment that they interact with. All right. Thank you. Any in-class examples? OK. <clears throat> um, I, another question that, that I had, and uh, anybody can, can really uh, jump in, nonprofit organizations, volunteer organizations play a big role in the interface between the public and, and, and sometimes policymakers and, and sometimes scientists aren't involved in that at all, but sometimes they are. Um, I guess, what has been your experiences in, in good, um, beneficial engagements with those organizations in water policy or awareness? Go with our current one of our current projects, one of our past projects. Our current project is uh, when it's up in St. Mary's area, is uh, partially supported by a number of contributors from different uh, different uh, folks. I mean, there's there's a fair amount of money coming in from different ag groups to help support the project in terms of the work that's going on. It's been a very and that, and that part of the project actually turns into an educational part. When you go to the meeting and talk about where their money's going, they want to know what you're doing, and then you have an opportunity to talk about the project and then what we're finding. And that's been a, that's been a very uh, Im important aspect. And before that, I worked on a, we worked on a project here with the Wabash River Enhancement Corporation, which is in Lafayette, and it's where they're based, they're a nonprofit, and Jane was involved, and a lot of us were involved in that project. And that was a very uh, wonderful experience working with those folks, because they were very much interested in improving the water quality in the, in the watershed in this region, and uh, they were very contributory in terms of uh, projects from their own support, and then helping us gather up other resources. So they had the, the basically a local connection that was very strong because of the way they're structured that they brought us into, which was a very nice arrangement for, for what, what the projects that would go on. They were very much driven by questions they had, uh, user questions, farmer questions, homeowner questions, those kind of things. But it gave us a way to connect to that in a very nice manner. So it's a little different than your normal funding stream. It's not, it's not NSF, it's a, it's a local, local source of money. But then the questions are very, uh, the, so most of the questions are very applied, but there's an opportunity to do other things within that within that uh, stream of uh, information. So it, it's a very good experience. Yeah, I like the idea of engaged science um, with different groups, and the Nature Conservancy has been, at least in Michigan, has been very involved in water issues, and and they've been um, seen as a very good um, resource and. There are other groups that are more activists, seen as more activists. The Sierra Club got some funding in. They were doing testing of E. coli all around, off farms and things. And even at MSU's campus, we were in the news uh, because they said we were violating the E. coli discharge. <laughs> and, uh, you know, but I think they, they all play a role. And I think that and get, and science engagement has, uh, the more we can do engage science, the better with our new tools. Um, we have to follow, I think, principles of engagement that um, timeliness, better communication, um, you know, the, the, the costs of doing engaged research, they don't have a lot of money many times, so you have to think about what you can really do for the resources available. So I think there's some principles that we need to be more aware of when we do that, but I think it's very important that we do that, uh, reach out there. and. Um, a scientist and work with these um, organizations. I would also say for the um, the Nature Conservancy has been a good partner for us as well. But it's an interesting point that you make about trust with the community and the particular perception of that NGO or whomever it might be. Um, I think in our case, working with folks at the Nature Conservancy, there is that trust and the community. Uh, the farmers and the local communities really do engage with those folks, but sometimes it can be the opposite effect. Um, and so those are challenging, like you said, some folks acting more in an activist kind of role. Um, so I think it's important as we go to seek these partners, partnerships and figure out the best kind of way to communicate our science and share what we know and help to improve environment, lives, et cetera, that we find good partners that, that really kind of do that interface and that cooperation really well. Great. 
Um, we're nearing the end of this uh, session, but I, I did want to uh, get your perspectives on some critical things that uh, some people in the audience are, are listening to, or they're themselves faculty or and, and supervisors. How does an undergraduate that's a freshman at a university or college, or maybe a community college, get involved into protecting drinking water? Is there a cookie cutter pathway that they should follow or how do they how do they do something they want to help but they maybe don't know how how, how would they do that and I'm going to let our guest of honor Dr. Rose stew on that for a second Thank you. <laughs> as I see her thinking deeply <laughs> and, I, and I'll ask one of our Purdue University faculty to to maybe chime in how, what would you recommend to somebody who wants to help as an undergraduate well, um, it's a very difficult question. Uh, I would say sometimes the students may not realize how uh, helpful or how willing the professors would like to help the students. So I have rarely seen students just go to my office and ask, okay, what kind of research are you doing? Is there any research opportunities that I could somehow get participate? You know, even at Purdue, we do have this independent study module. So you can earn three credits. Uh, you work in the lab with a graduate student, working on some water-related projects. So if if you are undergraduate students, next try to talk with your lecturers or professors and to see, you will be surprised what kind of research projects they have been working on for now or previously and their perspective on water issues. Probably gonna create some of those, uh, these uh, aha moment to see, okay, maybe I should just try this. So hopefully that's gonna help. This may increase the chances for them to get involved. Great, thank you. Anybody from Purdue? <laughs> Um, yeah, so getting involved with research is a, is a great way to get started in working with water protection. And I would say that there's definitely not one path to working, to actions that help protect the water. And that's really displayed by all of us up here from a lot of different um, academic disciplines and viewpoints, but, we're all, but we all would say that we, we, our work helps to promote um, clean drinking water. So. Um, getting back to the question about what freshmen can do to get involved, one thing would be to, um, one, one option is to take more classes that would give you more background in this area um, so that you could learn more about yourself. But another good resource would be that a lot of community organizations do need help sometimes from student interns to work on projects like this. I know that our, a lot of public health organizations in the community and across the state do hire undergraduates to work as interns over the summer, and you can get a lot of really good experience with um, protecting water and protecting health even from experiences like that. Thank you. Going to add um, being involved in extracurricular things, clubs on campus. There's lots of really great options for that, and so um, many of my students are involved in various kinds of these activities where they're working on active projects in the community, or they're maybe even just going and doing education and outreach to the great schools in the local area. So there's a lot of like uh, range of things that you can do outside of your classes that can help you kind of build that that um, repertoire. Said everything. Uh, and Dr. Well, you Rose. know, I was thinking about that. You know, the clubs, <laughs> they have that river cleanup, you know, day and that kind of thing. But ultimately, I think that water is very fragmented. So if somebody goes to the internet and says, what can I do? You get so, you know, this, that, and the other. This, this is over on the riverside. These are lake people. This is the so on and so forth. And we fragmented it in our education, too. I'd like to see more networking, like a water national, water national network that connected people in different disciplines, different schools, that had opportunities for students in, in variety. So I, I think we need more of a, a networking, uh, like a portal that connects us um, to each other. Um, and it's for students to enter, is they enter through the internet now. That, that's, they, they start to explore what their options are through these uh, media. And I would just love to see more of in networks. Uh, maybe we need a Big Ten water network. I think that's a great idea. And we can promote it at basketball games. And get on the jumbotron. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that would be 
<laughs> yes, a absolutely. <laughs> um, so, so with that, um, what I'd like to say is um, I appreciate all of your time and the College of Engineering for, for proposing um, this panel. Uh, Dr. Rose, we appreciate you for being here. Thank you for, for making the trip. Um, stay as long as you want. Uh, <clears throat> and um, with that, I'd like to uh, thank also the, 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 the people behind the scenes that, that aren't with their backs to you right now, but they're actually doing all the work. Uh, so thank you very much for putting this together. Uh, thanks to the dean and the, the vice president's office as well for, for supporting this activity and the distinguished lecture series. The, the, the faculty in the audience, uh, the, the Division of Environmental Engineering, Lyle School of Civil Engineering, uh, Agricultural and Biological Engineering, uh, and Agricultural and Economics, as well as some other uh, groups here. Thank you all for, for participating and, and, and coming to listen today. And if you would like to um, download this, uh, you can uh, check it out on Facebook. Uh, you can also send an email to the dean. Uh, and he, he and his staff will reply to you uh, with uh, how you can get that information. So in 50 years from today, if you are listening to this, uh, send us all an email and, and let us know uh, how we did. All right. So thank you very much, and thank you, uh, Dr. Rose. My pleasure. Great to be here.